Thomas, right, let's go. Um, yeah, Ian Thomas, uh, Senior Manager at EY, been with the firm for around 12 years now. Uh, before that, for my sins, I was with HMRC. Uh, replacing Andy Timpson today, anyone who's actually met Andy will know that he's a six foot five, huge strapping guy with a thick head of black hair so, uh, and no glasses, so he looks nothing like him. Um, but we're the same grade, so it's all good. Um, here to talk to you today about employment taxes. Um, you know, as David said, this is an area where obviously it concerns any employer really, particularly at the moment because there's a lot of changes happening, uh, which we're going to cover off today. Um, I could talk to you all day about employment taxes, but what we're doing is some of the key discussion topics we're seeing with clients at the moment. Um, and we'll run through those in a second. Um, we got the right one? Yep. Okay, we've gone forward a little bit. Let's, uh, let's back up. There we go. Okay. Um, Office for Tax Simplification. So, uh, what is the Office for Tax Simplification? Anybody heard of it? Any hands? No? Okay. Uh, it was a body set up about five years ago uh, to provide independent advice to government about the simplification of the tax system in the UK. Um, probably not without time. Uh, it, was, it is very complicated. The legislation, anyone who's been in this game for a long time will know the legislation has grown enormously uh, in, in recent years. So the OTS were tackled with, like, what can we get rid of? What's the stuff that people don't actually use at the moment um, and is pretty much irrelevant these days or certainly obsolete? Um, they started that, as I say, back in 2010. Uh, we're getting to the stage where they're starting to look at the more heavy stuff at the moment, uh, which we'll come on to. I won't do that yet. We'll come on to that. Um, something that they did get rid of, early doors, which is quite an interesting one. Uh, does anyone here remember... Uh, work, uh, luncheon vouchers. I'm looking at you, David. No, no offence. Luncheon vouchers. Anyone? Yeah. Does anyone remember how much they were worth? 25p. I couldn't remember, so I had to write it down. 15p. 15p a day. Tax exempt benefit. 15p a day. Introduced in 1946 because of food rationing after the war, and stayed at 15p a day up until they were abolished last year. So, you know, you could save up all your 15 Ps and you might be able to get a packet of crisps or something at the end of the week if you were lucky. So that's an example of tax legislation that's obviously out of date and needed to go, okay? Um, so one example, lots of other stuff has gone as well, um, but some of the key changes are now coming up, which the OTS have uh, suggested and have now been implemented, uh, have happened actually just recently, 6th of April. I wasn't planning to go into detail around this stuff because it is quite techy and I'm not planning to do techy stuff uh, this evening. Um, but I will run through the high level impact of some of this. So dispensation agreements going. Anyone, any idea what a dispensation is? David, you're not putting your hand up. I'm quite worried about this. <laughs> Partner EY. Uh, it's basically a bit of paper that you agree with HMRC that says you don't have to report certain benefits and expenses on the year-end form P11D. That's gone, okay? And the reason for that going is because HMRC were finding actually it's a bit of an admin exercise. It doesn't really do a lot these days, and it's much easier if we just get rid of that, put the rules into legislation, and again, go down that simplification route. What it means for you as employers? Well, if you had a dispensation before and you're relying on it to do a year-end reporting, some of you may have finance teams that know more about this stuff. Uh, you'll have to make sure that they know what they're doing going forward in terms of their reporting position going forward. Dispensations can't be relied on anymore, so they need to get their hands dirty and understand what the legislation actually means around the reporting of expenses and benefits for employees. Voluntary payrolling of benefits. Uh, that's what it says on the tin. This is where you have a benefit that you normally rep report at the year end. Instead of doing that at year end, you put it through the payroll uh, in real time, month on month. The idea is that you don't have to report it on the P11D. Again, gets rid of that paper trail and makes life easier for everybody. Of course, it's not as simple as that. This is HMRC we're talking about. Uh, the legislation that supports this was hastily drawn up. Uh, payroll providers that were going to run this stuff through their systems didn't have time to implement the controls they needed. And as such, no employers are actually ready or have been ready for the implementation from April. Uh, so if you're planning to do that, just take it with a pinch of salt, to be very careful on how you do it. Make sure you speak to your payroll guys uh, to make sure they are clear and know exactly what the pitfalls are. Uh, the last one here, trivial benefits. Um, again, that's what it says on the tin. The trivial benefit rules have been around for a little while. 
uh, it's basically where you provide employees with certain benefits that you wouldn't expect to receive a tax charge. Technically, they do, uh, so you need to report that somewhere. Uh, a good example of this might be where you have an employee that's sick or is getting married, having a baby, anything like that, and you give them maybe a bunch of flowers or something nice like that, um, which is completely non-work related, but is a benefit nonetheless. HMRC have very kindly said you don't have to tax those, and have always kind of taken a sort of laissez-faire approach to how you do that. Um, now the rules have become more rigid and given some monetary values as well, so some welcome guidance uh, for the likes of us that didn't really have a position beforehand. Okay, so some budget updates. Uh, again, this is quite techy. Um, the, the point we were expecting from the budget recently was that employment taxes would just receive this sort of tsunami of extra rules and regulations and, and really restrict some of the stuff employers were doing. Actually, none of that's happened. It's much less than we thought, and some of the stuff we were expecting to come out of it didn't actually happen. Um, what I was going to do today uh, is just run through some of the key points that did come out from there, uh, just so you're aware of them really more than anything else. I'm conscious I'm talking very fast at this point, so I'm going to try and slow down a little bit, but these are some of the areas I'm trying to get through uh, as part of this session. So employee travel was the first one. This is to do with the movement of your staff, so where they're moving around for business purposes, are they going to place that is not their normal place of work. If they are, they're probably submitting an expense claim for their travel to that location. And if they're doing that, you have to be very certain that the expense you're reimbursing isn't taxable. Because they may think they're going to a business address or business location, whereas in fact they're undertaking an ordinary commute due to the complex tax rules that are in place. Because the complex tax rules are there, the OTS, amongst others, have said HMRC, you need to simplify this because people just aren't getting it, including HMRC, I might add. Uh, so the suggestion was that they revise the rules around what is a permanent versus temporary workplace, what is business travel, what is ordinary commuting, and get that sorted out. Um, and the government said, yeah, let's do that. That's a good idea. We'll rewrite the legislation and we'll do this and we'll do that. So we're expecting something in the budget around that. In actual fact, HMRC said, no, we don't need to change the rules. Everybody understands them. It's all good. So there's no change at all on that. But what you do need to be aware of is where you've got employees moving around and you are reimbursing them for their travel. You need to be very certain that they are undertaking business journeys. If they're not, consequences can be very expensive, particularly where you've got company cars and private fuel inv involved as well. Uh, salary sacrifice. Uh, everyone heard of salary sacrifice? Nobody is? Yeah, a few nods. Uh, this is the giving up of salary in exchange for something else, typically a non-taxable benefit, such as a pension contribution. Um, where we are at the moment, with the government having no money, uh, they've basically suggested that salary sacrifice would need to be looked at again to remove any structures which give an unfair tax advantage to certain people and basically deprive uh, the government of, of revenue. So we're expecting some hard rules on this, and actually, the revenue has said, We'll, we'll keep an eye on it. We'll keep an eye on it. We're happy with the stuff that's uh, part of the political agenda, so you know, saving for old age, i.e. pensions, um, low mission cars, yeah, uh, childcare, getting uh, working mums back into the workplace and so on. That's all stayed, but they are going to keep an eye on it. So if you are running a salary sacrifice scheme at the moment in your workplace, just keep an eye on it, especially if it's not one of the standard areas that, that, that uh, HMRC agree with. Uh, termination payments, yeah, this was due uh, an overhaul. Um, and again, some OTS recommendations have, have, have sort of filtered through now. I get nothing actually changed per se, um, but there are some suggestions which will probably come through in, in due course. Um, one of the key ones is the, the £30,000 exemption, um, which most people associate with, with termination payments. Um, this has been around for an awful long time now. And I think somebody mentioned to me, if that had gone up with inflation, we're probably looking at a, a tax-free sum of, of in the hundreds of thousands rather than 30K. 
which would be quite nice. Um, but uh, but that HMRC is stuck with 30k. So they, they suggested that actually that 30k is adjusted for the length of service you're giving your employer. So watch this space on that. Um, things are likely to change very very shortly. Uh, some other bits and bobs in there as well. I'll let you read those in your own time. But um, just keep, keep an eye on termination payments because that is likely to be one of the things that changes going forward. Am I doing for time? Two minutes? Oh, God, okay. All right, I'm going to have to speed up a little bit. Sorry, guys. Um, yeah, so intermediaries in IR35, this is to do with the employment status of non-employee labour. Okay, so this is where you engage uh, a third party that isn't an employee, maybe a contractor, self-employed, working through some sort of intermediary. If you're doing that, you need to be very, very careful these days. There's a lot going on at the moment where HMRC are challenging the employment status of those workers and basically challenging that they're a de facto employee of the business. Now, if they're successful in challenging that, and by successful, I mean it goes through the courts uh, and they basically agree, uh, then you, your worker could be reclassified and as such you, as the employer, are stuck with the pay as you earn an NIC that you should have withheld. Right, let's really quickly do this. Okay, friendship levy. Okay, uh, so this is coming in in April 2017. Affects all employers. Okay, so anyone who's, who's an employer in this room. You pay at a, a rate of 0.5% of your pay bill into a levy fund to fund the new apprenticeship program that's going to be rolled out by government. Um, only affects you if your pay bill is more than three, um, three million. I was looking at the billion sign. That's not right. Three million pounds per annum. Um, when we say pay bill, what we're talking about is basically wages paid to your workers. So anything that's subject to NIC in effect. All employers will get an allowance of £15,000. That's why you only pay it if your pay bill goes over £3 million because 15 k is 0.5% of, of £3 million. Um, and you'll pay it through real-time information for those through your payroll system. Those funds will get uh, sent to HMRC's levy pot, which you can then access if you have any apprentices. So there's a piece we're doing now with, with, uh, with employers about how you structure your workforce to make sure you get some of this levy back again. Or indeed, if you're not actually uh, liable to pay it, to access the funds that are there, other people have paid in. Not as straightforward as that, of course. HMRC have not classified what an apprentice is, uh, which doesn't help. So it's very difficult to, to plan for this, uh, but you've got time to do it because it doesn't come in until next year. Uh, very quickly, is anyone in the room uh, an employer with more than 250 employees? I know you are. Okay, one at the back. Okay, so really quickly then, gender pay gap reporting. Um, at the moment, only affects em uh, employers with over, over 250 UK employees. That may change going forward. We don't know yet. Uh, basically, this is HMR, uh, the government's rather drive to uh, reg regarding equality in the workplace, making sure that uh, organisations are transparent in terms of what they pay people. <laughs> Broadly, what you'll need to do is report on your website the, the difference in pay between men and women. Um, you'll do that uh, based on mean and median pay, looking at base salary, bonus, and so on. Uh, it comes into force in October 16. Actually, the first reporting will be April 17. Um, and then 30th April uh, uh, annually thereafter. So you will have to do a regular reporting on your website of the pay disparity between the, the two two groups. Key point on this is that if you do have a significant gap in pay, it, you've got an opportunity to also include on your website a comment on why there is a difference. And this is really important for certain sectors of business uh, where you've got obviously a more uh, male focused or female focused um, workforce. My wife's a primary school teacher and there are no blokes in her school at all. So it's an all female workforce and you compare that to the likes of say Chelsea Football Club, who have got one less female now on their workforce, uh, all male, well, I say all male, mostly male anyway, certainly the high earners. Um, so, you know, it's the point there, identify, explain action. The reason for that is that you do have to report, but you do have the opportunity as well to explain why there is a pay disparity there. And then that's just everything we've talked about. That was a lot. That was a lot. Is that okay?